So it's at eight o'clock sharp. This is uh, Adir Posey. There we go. It is so wonderful to see everyone joining. And once again, I want to give a huge yeshe to Rabbi Lieberman, who uh, without fail, even in what's often known as the down season of the summer months, um, has yet g given us yet again a wonderful set of shirim to learn and to listen and to grow from. Um, it is continually Beth Jacob's privilege to be able to host this uh, series. Um, and we have gotten nothing but phenomenal feedback from the chance to learn with, uh, with uh, Billy Berman and the back and forth of the discussion that, uh, that enriches all of us. So on behalf of the shul, this is the third of our series. Uh, we'll be taking a break, but uh, you know, a God not forgotten in that we hope to re, uh, restart this, uh, this series um, after the Chagim. Um, but uh, just on behalf of Beth Jacob, I want to thank Rabbi Lieberman and everyone who's come and joined uh, for the opportunity to sit and to learn together. And we hope to continue to have wonderful opportunities to grow and to learn with you, Rabbi Lieberman, uh, in the future. And so our message to you is Yeshikoach and looking forward to the third installment. Uh, Rabbi Posey, thank you so much. Uh, again, I am honored and I want to thank uh, Beth Jacob for being the Afsania Shel Torah and hosting this. And then again, tonight we're coming to the last of this part of this encounter of Jews and the modernity and challenges that America presents to them. What I actually hope to get to tonight, and I might touch upon it, but I don't think I will, but who knows, uh, was the involvement of the American Jews. Um, and basically that's a traditional community the reform movement doesn't exist yet. These are all committed Jews, more or less committed um, Svardim Ashkenazim in, in the American Revolution itself. If we get to it, wonderful. But once we start again, I'll pick it up from there and stay within that uh, realm. Just to give you an idea of how rich that material is, uh, in 1975, at the bicentennial, uh, the American Jewish Ar Archives issued an entire volume of hundreds, two volumes actually, hundreds of documents, hundreds of Jews and the American Revolution from every detail, because most of us probably grow up or hear, oh, Chaim Solomon, and that's the end of the Jews and <laughs> some financial donation and whatever. Uh, that's not close. And I think it's extremely important, given the rise of anti-Semitism in this country, which we'll speak of a little bit today also in this colonial, colonial period, uh, for people to understand and for us Jews to know that the founding fathers themselves, and we'll maybe discuss one today and maybe more, uh, definitely more once we get to the uh, American Revolution itself, but Jews were involved. Now, were they all on the American side? Were some on the British side, maybe? We'll speak of those few in between, but overall they gave their lives. We know the names of the first victim, fighting and, and et cetera. And we'll see a little bit of that in a special letter um, that we'll be discussing today because of one of the personalities. So I left you off, if you remember. Let me just get all my 400 papers. Um, we left you off literally in Savannah. We had discussed the five famous communities that become established um, in the 13 colonies, let's put it that way maybe, et cetera, et cetera. And so you'll have Savannah, Charleston, which was an outgrowth of that. And then, of course, if you remember, Philadelphia, Newport, uh, New York. And normally when I do this particular segment, at least to my 10th graders at Shalhevet, the tiny component of American Jewish history, because it's modern Jewish history covering 1600s through the modern period. So how much, it's a couple of weeks for this segment. But I always point, point out these communities very briefly. And there's always one bright person um, who asks, but wait a second, Rabbi, where is Boston? Why isn't Boston up there? And the answer is because Boston did not have a Jewish community for quite a while. Granted, it plays a significant role and it'll 
be significant in a couple of minutes too, but uh, Jews didn't come to Boston. There's no community there per se until about 1840. And I, my memory serves me right. The first synagogue built there, Ohev Shalom, was like an 1840 something. And so it's kind of, I remember the, the demonic device actually, 1840, 40 Jews in Boston. Now we did speak last week of Salomon Franco who had worked for that uh, Massachusetts Bay Company, had brought over their goods, they refused to pay him, and he disappears from history. So he was in Boston for a while, but there is no community per se there <clears throat> until the 1840s. So going back to Savannah, again, the 40 some people that had left London on this boat with Oglethorpe had come there, established the colony, um, 1733, they built their beautiful temple, shul, which by the way, for a long time was traditional, orthodox. Again, the word orthodox does not exist in this particular time period, just to make that very clear. Uh, so I'll call them traditionals slash parentheses, what we call today orthodoxy. Uh, traditional Jews. And uh, they established their community Everything is really wonderful there. There was a little bit of anti-Semitism, but it was too late. They started. You know. So that's where we left you off, more or less. And I wanted, I was, one of the things I was saying is about Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardi Jews. And we'll discuss them more today because the initial communities of these five communities of, of New York, of Philadelphia, Newport, et cetera, were Sephardi communities, even Philadelphia. That should be like the way we see it. No, no, no. These were all Sephardi communities. But slowly there's an influx of Ashkenazi Jews uh, like we, we met uh, from Vilna, our Salivi. And here there, there are individuals. And once in a while, as the numbers grow, I mean, as the years go on, the numbers grow. But what is interesting about this particular shul in, in uh, Savannah the Mikveh Israel, again, a very popular name, made popular both by um, the Nevoah uh, that uses that word, and of course by a Menashe ben Israel's book that had become quite popular in the concept of the incoming and gathering of the exiles in some kind of a messianic period. Now that Jews will be scattered all across the world, God can collect us from all over the world and bring us back to the promised land. One of the early settlers of Savannah, not Jewish, was a, uh, what should I call him, a, a Lutheran minister whose name was Johann Martin Boltzolius. Now this Boltzolius sometimes spelled with B-O-L-T, Bolt or Boltzius, all kinds of spellings that sometimes is without a T, uh, is Lutheran, they had come from Germany, and the Germans had also come here to escape religious persecution back in a particular area of Germany. Now, this particular person, called this Lutheran minister, establishes a very important foundational community for Lutherans in this country, He's considered very important. He's established the whole Lutheran community in Charleston, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He kept on writing and keeping a record of how things in Savannah were going. And what I want to do is read to you his actual description, this, this minister of Reverend Bolzius, um, who in 1739 <coughs> writes to a friend in Germany he says, um, now, I did point out for a second last week that in Savannah, we already have a little bit of what we call in Hebrew Sikso. The community is Sephardi. They're looking to establish this huge perimeter of a whatever. They've come equipped with all their rituals, with, with the Chazan, not with the rabbi per se. Rabbis don't come to America yet. We'll meet one today who's a kind of interesting, um, but <clears throat> there was some Ashkenazim, about eight of them initially, coming all from London, like we want our own minion, like what should we do? 
And listen to what he says. Even the Jews, of whom several families are here already in Savannah, enjoy all privileges, the same as other colonists. Some call themselves Spanish and Portuguese. Others call themselves German Jews. Um, the latter speaks high German and differ from the former in their religious service and to some extent in other matters as well. And the former do not seem to take it so particular in regard to dietary laws. Okay, got that? Kashrut and other Jewish ceremony. They have no synagogue, which is their own fault, says this Lutheran reverend. Uh, and the one element hindering them is in this regard. The German Jews, this is a non-Jew writing in the late 1730s, believe themselves entitled to build a synagogue and are willing to allow the Spanish Jews to use it with them in common, however reject any such arrangement and demand the preferences for themselves. Um, enough said. So this begins a very interesting, uh, at this point I'll call it an anomaly because for most of it in the journey in America, Sephardim and Ashkenazi, whether by choice or not, really don't have much choice in trying to figure out like, hey, we need a minion. We have eight and two or whatever. Okay, Ashkenazi end up with the Sephardi congregations and they'll figure it out. But this becomes an interesting journey here, how the dynamics of Sephardi and Ashkenazi play out in this country. And we'll discuss it uh, a drop more. Having said that, uh, let me share the screen with you for a second. And anyone who knows what this is, uh, please like, and I'm sure you do, because every time I use it, uh, someone knows what it is. Okay, look at your screen and tell me what this is. <clears throat> Anybody want to tell Yale University? Yale, Yale. Yale University, right. So notice something interesting here. Uh, Yale University, you might find it in some others too, but Yale quite early had on its logo the words Urim Vitumim and Hebrew. Now, what is absolutely interesting, as the American colleges get established in this country first uh, with Harvard, then uh, William and Mary in the six, all 1600s, um, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, Yale, uh, a little bit later on, Princeton, King's College, which becomes Columbia, et cetera, et cetera. All these colleges, almost without fail, taught Hebrew. Hebrew was an absolute necessity at, in this particular early time period. Again, there were, you Puritans here, people who, to whom the Bible meant so much. If we look at the early settlements in this country and names of cities, they're all biblical, literally. Um, at some point, I'm not sure what the statistic would be today, uh, but I read this a long, long time ago, and it pointed out that the word Salem, um, the word the Yerushalem, the city of, of, of Malki Tzedek, the city of Jerusalem, there must have been close to 25 towns across this country that picked Salem or Zion, etc., etc., etc. So it's quite common. Hebrew was important um, to anyone who wanted some higher education. So therefore, these universities taught Hebrew. Now, who taught the Hebrew? Not Jews. 
These were people who had been trained in Hebrew already, maybe back in Europe, had come to this country and, and were all teaching Hebrew. Very nice. And the reason I bring this up is because I want you to meet a very interesting person. And this person will give us a sense of another major issue that begins to develop uh, in America at this time. So let me share the screen with you. Okay, let's look at this very carefully. Here it is. Uh, so if you look at it, you can make up on the upper page there, maybe I'll just enlarge it a drop. Dikduk uh, Lashon Ivrit. Now look carefully here. Dikduk Lashon. Now what happens here? How do we get this G in there? And E, and this should be Ibrit. Okay, but okay, let it go for a minute. Uh, a grammar of the Hebrew tongue being an essay to bring Hebrew grammar into English, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Notice um, it's at Harvard speak of the year in a minute. Uh, you can see the Hebrew here at the bottom. Anechbar v'hugatbi unimrat al yedei Yehuda Munish. Okay, or the way it's Munukad here, Munis. Composed accurately and corrected by Judah Munis, printed in Boston. Um, now, who is Judah Munis? Who is this fellow? And his story is an interesting one, um, though quite a sad one in, in many ways. Judah Munis himself um, was probably an Italian Jew, clearly of Spanish uh, origin, who comes to this country in the early 17, I guess about 1715, 1716, he attended school in, in Livorno, Italy, had studied at the great Yeshivot in Livorno, had come to this country, and uh, that was after, sadly, he got married back in Italy. Um, soon he had a son. The son, sadly, passed away uh, not long after birth. Soon after that, his wife dies. This guy's broken. He leaves Italy. Um, and he comes to the States. Now, exactly where he ends up is not very clear. Records indicate that he might have been a Balcora uh, in Jamaica. We find him in New York, then we find him all over the place. Then again, dates, because some of the records are rather scant. Yehuda Munis is running a grocery store, and he's making money in New York. And he begins to teach Hebrew, both to Jews and non-Jews. And he begins to get into discussions about Kabbalah. Now he's teaching to non-Jews. Now which non-Jews? Mostly Christians who were very religious, some of them minister, reverends, whatever title they might have had, who obviously bring up Christianity and Jesus and the question of like, oh, why don't you believe in this and all that. To make a long story short, uh, Judith Munis shows up in Boston, uh, a Jew in Boston now, when there's hardly any Jews here. He is in Boston, <coughs> comes there with his wife. Um, he had been married earlier. Uh, again, comes there with his wife, and sadly, um, not sure what he wants to do. He applies as a student at Harvard. And yeah, roughly in the seven, 1720s, he gets a degree, an MA, 
from Harvard. First Jew recorded on record of a Harvard MA certificate, diploma, whatever it is. Within a year or two, he presents to Harvard his book that you've just seen, this Dictoc Lashoni Brief, with the notion of teaching Hebrew at Harvard. There was only one problem. Harvard at this stage didn't, even though it was te teaching Hebrew, but in order to have a professorship at Harvard, you needed to be Christian. Uh, and can you guess what he does? Judah Munis becomes one of the first recorded Jews who converts, converts to Christianity. This aroused a tremendous reaction in different quarters in different ways. At Harvard itself, uh, it was a course celebre. There was actually, you can search for it, you'll find it. Uh, Reverend Coleman, I believe his name was, delivered an entire sermon on the chapel at Harvard at this conversion where the, where the conversion actually took place. It's been published. It's a tiny, thin little booklet in there if you read it. And many felt this way. It was the beginning of the mass conversion uh, of Jews to Christianity. We now have this fellow. He had been a Jew. He had now officially converted. He will go and teach his people. A word will get out and we will teach our own to be able to go out and somehow use this language uh, in a way to convert people. Now, let me share the screen with you for a very different document, totally related. In this book, Munis translates a tremendous amount of Christian material too, the famous Lord's Prayer, Hebrew kind of simple, of English and Bashamayim, Father thou art in heaven, in the Hebrew, all parts of the New Testament in Hebrew, some of the other prayers are there, English and Hebrew. He translates different parts of the Jewish Bible, Tanakh into Hebrew there. Now, whether his Hebrew is actually a scholarly Hebrew, it was pretty clear even from some of the people who taught at Harvard or who came after him that his book had deficiencies and that's not important for us in this lecture. The way he was monarched certain words and the way he transliterated, et cetera, et cetera. Now, just to go back uh, for a tiny second to the book itself, that gimel there is that guttural ayin that Sephardim were pronouncing, you know, We've discussed this a number of times in our lectures, why I don't remember anymore. But it's, you know, we Ashkenazim, it's Shir Hamalos or Shir Hamalot. And the Ayn and the Aleph are almost uh, brother and sister. In really true Hebrew, uh, while the Ayn is getting kind of lost, it sounded literally almost like a gimel, but you didn't say the gimel. So it's Shir Hamalot. <clears throat> Okay, right. It's a good. So when well, you want to say good, but you don't say good, you just begin just to make the good sound. Okay. Anyway, so this particular uh, verse is found towards the end of the book. I like what at the end of the entire book. Let me share the screen with you. Oh, I might be up there already. Hold on. Yeah, here it is. Here's a Pasuk in Tzfanya, Paragimel Pasuk Tet. Um, so notice the Pasuk for a second. Ki'az, says Hashem, clearly speaking to Kol Goye Haaretz and all the Pasukim that, that come before. At that point in the future, Epoch El Amim, I will turn to the nations, Safabrura with a clear language, 
Likro Kulam, that they all should read B'Shem Hashem, La Abdo, Shechem Echad, etc. So this is the Pasuk and Sophania. The Rishonim, if you learn this Pasuk, um, the Marikara, uh, Ibn Ezra, Radak, I don't think there was a Rashi to this Pasuk, but I don't remember, but if Rov Rishonim say Safa Brura Lashon HaKodesh. And clearly this Judah Munis understood and he believed and scholars today are kind of trying to figure out what was Munis actually trying to do with this book. We do know about him, which was kind of shocking that, and I said earlier, all these reactions happened. The Jewish community who hear, that hear about this, wherever they are not happy about this, that a Jew had converted, he's at Harvard teaching Hebrew, this was not a good press for him at all. In the Christian community, there is some good press, as some of the learned and people at Harvard, and some were very suspect of him. Uh, he keeps on being referred to as the converted Jew, uh, the Christian Jew, not very nice types of name, or some actually call them the converted rabbi, Judah Munis clearly is not attached to anybody, really. He's got his wife. We know pretty much, though, from his own records at the time uh, and other people who've watched him, that this fellow kept Shabbat for the rest of his life. So was he doing a Morano stint and somehow in this particular book, he was hoping that through teaching Hebrew, some other mission would be accomplished here? And I don't know. I'm just putting out there um, what scholars recently uh, have done with this, trying to figure out exactly what was his particular agenda. Uh, clearly, with the ending of this pasuk at the end of the book, it gives the impression that there was something in mind here. Did he think of a Hebrew religion, Jewish religion that would allow Christians to come into it? Was he thinking of a Christian religion that somehow became Hebraicized? Again, these are this is terminology that scholars use. I don't know, but it does make for food for thought about this fellow. And I use this only, this example, quite interesting because it's the first, or definitely one of the first of one of the things that happened in this country. The minute Jews arrive, granted 90% will stick to the Jewish community. But there's that 10%, especially in this time period, and numbers will grow. They will grow literally as we speak of 2021. Assimilation has been on an upsurge all the time. The question is, what's the percentage we all remember the Pew study <clears throat> about eight years ago or so, nine years ago. Uh, it was quite shocking. And even earlier than that, in the year 2000, uh, the prediction of the New York Times in the late 80s had been that by the year 2000, the Jewish community would dwindle down in this country to almost nothing because of the rate of assimilation. Of course, what they didn't take into account is the growth of orthodoxy uh, and all that, and a whole bunch of other factors. But okay, be that as it may, today the rate of assimilation is quite high. Uh, people, historians debate clearly over 50, is it 55 to like 65, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The numbers of, uh, are quite astounding. They run into millions as we hit uh, the 50s, the 60s, and 70s altogether. Uh, with all millions of Jews who just left the faith. Is that part of a prophetic idea where the Jews always are uh, that smaller people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but it's an interesting idea. So the rate of assimilation was quite high in this country and it will cause issues in certain communities where certain laws are not kept or someone in the community now has left the faith 
et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing I wanted to bring up. We'll come back to it as we come into the 1800s, a few lectures down. At the same time, as much as Jews are having an amazing time in this country, uh, there is anti-Semitism. It is not like perfect. In the literature um, published in this country, late, uh, early 1700s through you still look Jew is depicted as a villain in, in, in drama and plays across uh, the country. Jews are always referred to as merchants, like the merchant Jew. Uh, and not in a term where we today say, oh, look, that guy's good, he's in business, he's doing no, 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 no. It, it was a derogatory term, which by the way, the if one, and I've never seen a study of this, but I noticed it all across. The phrase, the merchant Jew in its reincarnations from the early medieval period through this time period, and even today may be an anti-Semitic literature in a different way of the Jews controlling things has always been there. In the earliest documents, that actually survive from the Carolingian period, from Charlemagne, when Charlemagne actually gave the Jews a tremendous amount of monopolies and gave them special privileges more than anyone else. They were able to travel, et cetera, et cetera. You all remember, for example, the elephant story, right? And, and that point was always, even a Latin phrase was that, uh, the mercantiburium uh, mercantile. All Jews were merchants. It's like a given, in a derogatory way. It was not in, a, in an amazing, wonderful type of uh, of situation. So there is anti-Semitism. It, it shows up in different cities, even in Newport. Um, um, the, the synagogue against vandalized in the 1770s. In Philadelphia, there was a Jew who was attacked almost to be killed, uh, and he didn't. Um, there were other places where Jews were not allowed to establish, establish colonies. In Virginia, it was not doable in the, in the early 1700s, 1730s, 1740s. It took a while. So there were all these laws that limited Jews. It was kind of interesting that here are people seeking freedom from any tyranny of religion with the open mind of religion. We'll come back to that a little bit, but it was not a dream world yet. It was not perfect. Again, this is not huge. Uh, again, you, you know, the formula of anti-Semitism in Jewish history, it is always there. The only question is, is it minimal? Is it 2%, 5%, 8%, or is it et cetera, et cetera? So when it's low, it's just, okay. It's, it's almost like non-existent. You don't hear much of it, it doesn't get reported. You, you hear in there an incident and okay. <clears throat> and that's, I guess, true uh, always of newcomers as we see in this country today uh, with immigrants and, and outsiders, never, never welcome even though the people who are doing this at some point themselves were the newcomers, but you know, history forgets all that. Okay, so there is anti-Semitism, there is assimilation, and now I wanna share something, two interesting things with you. Um, let me just go find my next page here. Okay. Mihuze ve'ezehu. Anybody want to venture to tell me who is? Here he is. Who is this man? Look at his garb carefully. Uh, and anybody want to tell me uh, who he is? Anybody want to tell me what does he look like? Nobody? Like a Cossack. 
<laughs> yeah, not bad, not bad. From Turkey? Why? Um, the, I don't know, just says Turkey to me. Okay, interesting, okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, say hello to Harav, want to call him Gaon, you could do that too. Uh, Rafael Chaim Yitzchak, Rafael Chaim Yitzchak Karigal. Let's call him Rav Karigal. Okay, he is uh, from Hebron. This fellow, Rav Karigal, interestingly enough, born in Hebron, and he literally, I wish he would have very little has survived from him. And I'll show you in a minute what did survive. But he should have done, for those of you who remember the lectures uh, about travel logs, when Jews travel, going back to the early travelers who recorded Jewish community up to, you know, Benjamin II of the 1800s, who actually came to the States. But uh, the travel logs, and these people travel to Jewish communities, sometimes being the Mishulachim and the collectors. Now, before we go on with Rav Karigal, let me make a separate, very important point. And this now unites the entire Jewish world as it still does today. If anybody remembers the two lectures that uh, were hosted by, by Doctors Winter, Howard, and, and Dr. Ann in their home for two Saturday nights. Uh, we were discussing the history of philanthropy, the idea of Jews giving charity. And we brought it up again when we discussed Poland about um, two years ago at the Beth Jacob lectures for, for Poland alone. But no matter where Jews lived in every single time period, there was a collection taken up for what we today call Israel, Palestine. At the same time, Rav Karigal is the first known rabbi who comes to the Americas and travels. We'll discuss him in a minute. Prior to him, in Newport alone, from records but no names, we know of six other rabbis and 1700s, who have come from the land of Israel. Okay, not the modern state of Israel, it's not there yet. This is the 1700s. Jews, no matter where, either individually, collectively uh, in a city, always had what becomes more known in the 1600s, <clears throat> officially, with the Vad Arba Ratzot, the Council of Four Lands in Poland, the Kupat Eretz Israel. The minute a guest from Israel arrived in this country, uh, they traveled to the communities, immediately they were welcomed, Achnasat um, Orchim, a Kavod, the shul keeps a record, which is an addition, by the way, to something we will discuss maybe a little bit uh, later on, uh, not yet. But the charity and the benevolent society started in this country to worry about the other Jews who are not wealthy. And there's poverty too. Granted, some of these Portuguese, Spanish families, and eventually some of the Ashkenazi families become wealthy, come already with their wealth. But that was not the way it was going to be. They were poor. Uh, and therefore, there was a collection for the poor. A separate collection always made was for Eretz Israel. So interesting that here are the Jews here coming from their mostly Morano background. Spanish Portuguese were the, you know, was the overwhelming first generation. But for them to keep in mind the constant <clears throat> struggle of Jews in the land of Israel. And they collected and sent, and we have the amounts, and sometimes you look at them and you say, that's all they sent. Um, I remember my first time looking at it. The congregation, I think in Philadelphia, said like $24. 
I'm thinking, come on, you couldn't get, get up. $24 was a significant sum. Uh, and of course, they all pulled together. And, and it, you know, this, this is the Kupat Eretz Israel that uh, kept on going. Now, why am I telling you about uh, Rav Karigal, who, again, is born in Hebron, travels the Jewish world, comes here, goes to Barbados, goes to New York, goes to Philadelphia. And in 1773, so we're jumping a drop, we're getting close to the American Revolution. 1773, he finds himself in Newport, Rhode Island at the shul. Um, so let me share a different picture with you and say hello. Let's say goodbye on my screen to uh, Rav Karigal. And let's welcome a different fellow. Now, I don't expect you to tell me who this fellow is. I would be really impressed, but I don't think that's doable. Well, who knows? People always see interesting pictures and somehow retain uh, who they are. Okay. Ezra Stiles. Oh, Dr. Hershkowitz, a doctorate for you. Uh, you just earned it. Famous Ezra Stiles, who was living in Newport at this time. And Ezra Stiles, what can I say about him? Uh, loved Hebrew. And in March um, of 1773, finds himself in shul in Newport. Now, Ezra Stiles is not Jewish, clearly not. Um, he's a reverend. But he's so interested in Hebrew, he's so interested in religion, and he was watching the Jewish community in Newport and their minhagim, wrote about them. Ezra Stile had met five other rabbis in Newport that he wrote about. Um, kind of interesting. And in, in, in his case, we do have some of their, their names. But what becomes interesting is, and let me read a description uh, of, of what happened. He says, um, on March 8th, okay, and by the way, Ezra Stiles was the minister of a church in Newport. And that Ralph Carrigal, by the way, side comment, goes to the church and sits there to see what goes on. Um, it was not shocking for anybody. The fact that recently one of our uh, important rabbis had gone into a church for a particular reason caused the whole cause celebre but no one made an issue here at all. It was basically just to, to learn and to study. I'm not entering the halachic perimeters of going into a church at this point. <clears throat> when we give a halachic share, we could discuss that too. Anyway, he records in his diary, and I'll read verbatim, Ezra Stiles. There I saw uh, Rabbi Karigat. I judge him, he says, to be roughly about 45 from the city of Hebron, the cave of Machpelah in the Holy Land. He was one of the two persons who stood by the, now in English, no one knows what this is, you have to be Jewish, but the Chazan uh, at the Teva, which he describes, the reading desk, while the book of Esther was read. He was dressed in red garment, this is, by the way, Purim, with the usual phylacteries, white silk, wore a high brown fur cap, had a long beard. He had the appearance of an ingenious and sensible man. And he describes this rabbi all the time. They become friends. They spend, I don't know how much time together, but they have, based on Ezra Stiles' diary, 28 meetings that last for hours each. Uh, Rav Karigal teaches him Hebrew, and I think to such a degree that eventually they correspond long after Rav Karigal leaves um, in Hebrew. 
and some of those letters have survived. Quite impressive. Now, this is interesting, because what you have here is a particular time period that doesn't really repeat itself this way, where the curiosity regarding the Hebrew people, many have not, in wherever they came from, initially ever seen Jews. They come to this country, and the Bible is so important here. It is studied, it is discussed, and the Hebrews, and yes, some will make that distinction, which was made by early, early church uh, fathers about the Jews and the Hebrews. Okay, that continues into this time period. But for those who know a little bit more about the Hebrews and the Jews, uh, that anti-Jewish feeling is really not there. It's almost like a philo-Semitic feeling. And they become good friends. They discuss Minhagim. They discuss Kabbalah. Um, Ezra style for the rest of his life. Love this man. And he actually approached an important person who we're not dealing with much, who I really should spend more time about, Aaron Lopez, uh, a fabulous Jew, also more on a background, who only comes out in the open as being a Jew once he hits this country and becomes a full-fledged Jew, which is the story of so many of them, by the way. Uh, even though they might have left Portugal and in London or wherever, no, no, they're, they're not professing their Judaism out loud yet. In this country, they are, and they're proud of it. And it's amazing how none of them need to be educated, which now leads to a whole different question that has to do with a famous debate that you might all remember we discussed ages ago when we spoke of the Moranos. Historians argued, and today I think it's quite clear, two famous historians were Yosef Chaim Yoshami of, of Colombia and of course Bibi's father, um, Ben Sion Netanyahu, who had written much about the Moranos. And the debate was how religious were Moranos into that second and third and fourth generation when they could no longer put up a mezuzah, they could not do anything, there was no circumcision anymore. How did that even play out? And you know what? They argue, some say they remained, some say they didn't, they were being judged by different standards, halakha would judge them by different standards, et cetera, et cetera. What you see today uh, is quite clear, and especially the Portuguese Jews who were converted in one shot, that their religion of remaining Jewish and committed was absolutely unbelievable. And I say that with like the, the inquisitional records haven't been, again, studied not all, but enough to see that over and over again, these were people who kept their traditions this way, in a hidden way, for, for over five, six generations, over 100 years, <clears throat> to the 1700s, okay, mind you. And therefore, it, it was, now this Aaron Lopez helped establish the, 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 the um, Torah synagogue in, in Newport, and he's friends, of course, with Ezra Style. Ezra Style asks, please, get me a painting of, of this guy, get me a portrait. And the portrait you saw was the one commissioned by Aaron Lopez of Rav Karigal that so endeared himself to Ezra Stiles. And soon after that, Ezra Stiles becomes, uh, as Dr. Hershkowitz quickly yelled out, because I'm sure he recognized it, um, the president of Yale. And they were teaching Hebrew there already. Ezra Stiles just like put a stamp on this has to, every student had to take it. Um, when Ezra Stiles uh, died and he assumed the position for, of, of president of Yale for many years until his death, uh, freshmen complained, they don't want to take Hebrew anymore. And slowly it, it just goes out of the curriculum. But that is an interesting, one of the interesting encounters of, of what happens in this country with, um, with this particular meeting okay here's the rabbi and look look at what happens the portrait by the way of karigal 
hung in Yale for many, many years. Last I asked, which is 20 years by now, maybe it's up somewhere. It was not no longer hanging in Yale. Uh, but again, I have not visited Yale um, ever, actually. So the picture uh, is not there. It's probably one of their archives. I don't know. So that puts that out there. Now, I want you to look at one more. Uh, let me see if I can find it. The portrait of a different woman. The problem with this portrait is that you're looking at this woman uh, when she is already in her 60s. But what I want to do is tell you her stories and then uh, stop there for, well, let's see how much time we have. Okay, I would be surprised if anybody can tell me uh, who this woman is. Okay, it's actually a copy of a, of a different portrait. The original has disappeared. It was done by, by a famous American artist who drew many portraits, uh, Charles Walton Hayes. If you look at the many paintings from this time period of important people. Um, <clears throat> he is the one who uh, painted these pictures. They actually painted one of other members of the family, but okay, uh, we'll speak of her a little bit. A very important, amazing woman. Now we spoke of the Savannah community starting in 1733 and the Shul. Two of the people who arrive with that community, not simultaneously, um, will be a woman, not the one you've seen, a woman by the name of Tsipora Nunes. Tsipora Nunes from the Nunes family, again, a very famous established Morano family, mostly physicians. Um, Tsipora Nunes, again, grows up, Portugal escapes, gets to London, from London. Um, she already married, uh, <coughs> comes to this country and they have a number of children. Now she marries a fellow whose name is uh, David Machado, also from the same community. David Machado, as he came to this country, ended up at Chay with Israel first back in New York at that Spanish Portuguese where he was the Chazan, soon after joins his wife um, in, in, uh, uh, in Savannah. In 1746, one of their children is a very famous woman whose picture you saw at the age of 60. Her name being uh, Rebecca Nunes Machado, and I'll throw in there her official name, sometimes known shortly as Rebecca Phillips, married to Jonah Phillips, that we'll discuss a little bit at the beginning of our next lectures. But this woman, the daughter of the Tsipora, and their children and their grandchildren have recorded the journey of their mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, this, this Rebecca. Her, and this is again to, to the point I was making earlier. She was so meticulous in her religious observance as a Morano that her great-grandson tells us, we yeah, learned he heard this from his mother, and she had said it many times about her own mother, this Rebecca, that any time the clock struck, then I heard two o'clock, three o'clock, in the waking hours, she would stop and offer a prayer um, related somehow to the Inquisition. It these were people who had kept religion in secret for so long, come to this country, and she too initially tells us, even the daughter Rebecca, um, in the beginning would pray, only holding some of the things that Christians hold in their hand. Hebrew prayers, mind you, 
and mumbling that, but holding on to an item which is uh, more of a rosary type until eventually, like, they have to let go of it here. They realize this isn't, even though they were doing this for generations, they don't want to be caught on. So they hold on to this thing and, you know, we'll say to Hillam, a woman whose kashrut standards were extremely, extremely uh, high. No one cooked in her kitchen. And by the way, Sephardi Jews in this country in the initial period that when they arrived here did not take servants. And if they did, not in the kitchen. And if they did in the kitchen, they had to be over them the entire process, uh, much more than the Ashkenazim. And why that's so uh, <coughs> has maybe to do with the halachic uh, dispute between Sephardi and Ashkenazim. These were women who cooked themselves, made themselves, and just absolutely participated in Jewish life. And I say that because you might remember, and, and, and if you have nothing to do, it's a book worth reading. It's called Heretics or Daughters of Israel by Renee uh, Levine Malamid. I've used it once for a couple of seconds. I held it up when we discussed uh, uh, Morano's but it is her contention, and she seems to be right, and uh, Rebecca Nunes Machado, eventually Phillips, is a super clear example of that. And that is that what absolutely ensured within the entire Morano diaspora, the transmission of the Jewish heritage and knowledge to a first generation, to a second generation, to a fourth, to a fifth, to a sixth, into this country with the mothers. Absolutely astounding. And she proved it with the inquisitional records of Castile. Uh, and now that this has become a pretty much accepted notion, uh, you know, back to the Pasuk and Mishle of Al Titos Torah Imecha, do not forget the Torah of your mothers that particular pasuk so aptly applies to the Morano exiles in this country who in a minute are able to go from that shadowy living of Judaism where they can't practice to be so proud of being Jewish that here they are, they'll get involved, they'll build a synagogue, a shul, and, and again, these five communities do have attached to that, first beginning in New York with Shader Israel schools. And yes, believe it or not, some of the people teaching were women. And to end off the journey of Jews in America, a little bit of, yes, serious assimilation, a little bit of anti-Semitism. There is a Sephardi Ashkenazi dynamic here, but this particular woman, Rebecca, will at the age, um, I think of 18, Mary Jonas Phillips, an Ashkenazi Jew, who had actually, and I'll discuss him next time, who had become a shochet at Shevi Israel in New York. So here's an Ashkenazi shochet of Bodek. He does it all, also checks. Some were just shochtim. They couldn't check the kasher of the animal. He did both. And he marries one. He's looking to get married. Who's he going to marry? Is not eligible Ashkenazi women. Well, here's the second generation, because in 1746, this Rebecca was born. Jonas Phillips, as some of you, I believe, should know a little bit about, uh, but we'll discuss him when we start again next time, as the journey of the Jews in America continues. And that will bring a little bit more of a unity between Sephardim and Ashkenazi. So that dynamic plays like boom, and also boom, um, of course, Achtut is the answer to all. So thank you so much for your time and enjoy. And then whenever uh, Beth Jacob puts in a calendar, which I'm sure will be after the Chagim, not before, we'll continue with this. And again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ann Winter for taking care of us. And of course, the Achsan Yishol Torah, Beth Jacob, Rabbi Tab, and Rabbi Posey, and of course, all of you, especially uh, those I see from the East Coast who've joined us every week. Uh, you must be insomniacs. I hope you get some good sleep and brachan hatzlacha uh, to all of you and all the best. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.
Be well. Thank you, Rabbi. Be well. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. You're welcome. Rabbi Lieberman, I, I, I knew of Ezra Styles only because you mentioned Rabbi Harry Thank Howell. You. I think we discussed years ago how I read in the, at the Center for Jewish History about Ezra Styles' report of the resplendent Rabbi Karagal apparently on the eve of Purim wearing his phylacteries and the whole discussion and you know what's going on. They, they probably dabbed early. He was wearing them because he wore it all day. Uh, well, I, I really, yeah, yeah. I remember, remember our discussion on that? I, 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 vaguely I do, but one other thing which I only recently paid attention to, and, and that is, and again, please, no one needs to stay on it. I, I don't, I hate going over Tom. I know your time is precious. <laughs> it's actually, uh, when, when um, Styles describes his tzitzit, he was wearing tzitzit. Okay, so an amazing, whatever, de there's many details here. Many have written about it. Um, again, not enough and not all in one volume, but it's a fabulous story um, of, of interaction between these two interesting. So thank you, everybody, uh, and good night.